Good evening, everybody. All right, we got a lot of people already showing up, man. <laughs> hey, Patrick Dickey said, I got a Dakota lithium battery this week. Your Hashinasi code is still working, I see. I'll be putting it through its paces over the next week or so. Awesome. Well, hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Ham Radio Crash Course. The chat's already blowing up as usual. I'm starting about a minute early, and that's just because we've had kind of a crazy week here. The kids were sick. My wife was sick. I'm the only one that's bested the the fury that is this plague that they've they've contracted. So I'll get the stream going as fast as we can, get through the content in a timely manner. I think is going to be good to, to avoid the screaming children. So as always, we'll wait a little bit for everybody to come in, and then we'll hit the news of the week since we last talked. Got some some news. Some news has been going on. Good evening. Clint's in the room. Hey, what's up? And we got Carrie and Jason. Hello from Texas from John. We've got, who else? We've got Wayne Dickinson from Arizona. Awesome. Matthew, I appreciate the thank yous. Here at Quebec, November. I didn't get that full call sign. This is KI6NAZ live on the Ham Radio Crash Course. How you doing? Nope. Maybe not. Kilo Echo Zero, Sierra Quebec November, KE Zero SQN, and I'm doing good. Good deal. So we're kicking off the live stream right now. Do you have any comments or anything before we go right into the news of the week? No, I was just kicking into the, the repeater here on the DMR side. All right, sounds good. Okay, I'll uh, I'll turn it back over to you, and we'll be monitoring on the live stream and talk group. 31621 for everybody on the internet. All right, I'll leave that semi-volume turned on so we can hear it in case somebody kicks on. Anyways, all right. Whew, crazy week. Great. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and open this beer because I've been waiting to open this thing. So the brew crew for the week, the Nautilus Harbor, Harbor, and it's a uh, barrel-aged plum sour i am crazy excited about this one Whew, crazy week as always i don't think there's ever a time i start one of these where i'm like man this has been a totally relaxing normal week with nothing that happened out of the ordinary Ooh, that is a that is a big balmy fruit oh wow look at that i kind of expected it to come out purple for some reason i said plum and i'm like oh it's gonna come out plum colored no it's not all right, so moving forward with ham radio, you know, we always talk about this. This first thing I talk about is what do we do moving forward? What do we learn? How do we keep making small incremental changes to better ourselves through ham radio? Learn more, have more fun. I'm challenging myself this month. For the remainder of the month, aside from whatever we do on these videos, like I was just doing with the DMR, I'm only going to be operating on CW. I'm going to try and make it only CW. I'm going to try and work all my contacts on CW. I don't expect a lot, but I, I think that it's going to help me get moving in the right direction. I take the apps. I use the apps. I'm about 18 words a minute, and I think I just need to just dive in head first and start making QSOs. I think that's the only way around it. So I'm going to be following following the um, the activators on Soda this weekend, and I'm just going to try and use it whenever I can. What I have been doing, which is very cool, is you go to, I believe it's 14.475, which is the W1AW uh, bulletin message that goes out every day. So check that out. Look up the W1AW bulletin if you're interested in copying CW kind of in and around the United States. It's a really good way to do that. Whew. Oh, man. Hallelujah. Wow, that is sour. Guys, <laughs> Whew. guys, we've got merch. The link's in the description if you want a Ham Radio Crash Course t-shirt. And along those lines, I have a sticker update. I heard from the printer today. I saw the prints or the proofs of the sticker. They look awesome. So she's gone into full production with the stickers. And she's in California, actually pretty close to me. So I should have those very soon. The only thing I need to do is figure out how best to get them to you guys. Uh, the patrons, the, the $10 patrons, they're going to get one for free. I'm just going to ship those out to everybody. And some of the other ones, I'll probably do it as well. But I just need to figure out what kind of, like a web store of some kind. I got a website, hoshnasi.com, that I'll probably just figure out how to do that there. 
I have a shout out. I started doing this recently and I really like doing this kind of call out to um, channels that I like on YouTube. This is OH8STN, the survival tech nord. I really like his stuff. So if you had me as a guy who's kind of like haphazard, I'll just jump in and kind of figure a way out and that'd be me. I'll just kind of deal with it, right? The tech nord, survival tech nord, He's very methodical. All his videos are very well thought out, really nicely edited. They always have some kind of voiceover. Does a very good job. So we're kind of like a polar opposites. I'm kind of a crazy get her done kind of guy, and he's a very thought out, methodical dude. So major shout shout outs to OH8 STN. He did this um, the radar challenge, July 2018 hiking and ham radio video. He's got a little trailer that he pulls behind him, and he has a couple different radios that he brings, a couple of different solar panels. The guy's prepared for for just everything, so super, super cool on him. So, yeah, cheers to him. All right, what do we got? Oh, Zach's here. What's up, Zach? I'm glad to see you here. Click that like button. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you add it to the merch on here? Um, good question. I don't think I can. I think those those guys just want to use their software and they don't want to use or not their software their merch they don't want to use my merch. Don't know. I may I may end up having to sort that out. Oh well, that's very nice of you, Truth Hill Mofo. He says he puts out great fits, but he's no hosh. I'm just different than him. I make different stuff. He makes specific stuff that's good for him. I love that kind of stuff. I love everybody having their own kind of space that they can be creative in the way they want to be. I don't even mind people that produce similar content. I'm just saying he's unique. So I like that. Hmm. So again, just a repeat for the brew crew coming into the room here. The Nautilus Harborer by Modern Times is a barrel-aged plum sour bomb. Uh, this thing's pretty funny. Let me show you this. There's no, there's no barcode. So when I went to go buy this, they couldn't figure out how to charge me for it. I'm like, it's free, guys. Just let me have it. It's free. Obviously, it's a sample. Good though. Wow. Okay. So upcoming videos. I was at HRO today and I shot a video with Billy Bob at the HRO in Anaheim. He wanted to talk specifically about the FT70, the Yesu FT70, which is an entry level HT with System Fusion. I thought that was a great idea. And it just so happens that one of you in the comments had asked me, hey, can you make a video on the FT70? Um, I have... Um, all kinds of problems programming it. I was like, really? I heard it was quite easy. And I think the very next day I was at the HRO and Billy was talking to me about how much he likes programming the FT70 because it's so straightforward. And it is. It's very, very easy. So I will be putting that out hopefully Monday or Tuesday next week. I just got to find time to edit it this weekend. But that's going to be awesome. And then, of course, Field Day MVPs Part 1, the, the wrap-up, the finale is coming up. I bet you can all figure out what my MVP is, the number one MVP. But I'll let you guys post that in the chat. And uh, it was already mentioned earlier, Dakota Lithium Battery. The coupon's still active. If you use the code HoshNasi, they'll give you a discount there. And I got to tell you, I can't beat that battery for the price. You're not going to get a BioNO at that price. You're not going to get a battery of that capability for under $100, straight up. And what's, what's more is it's very easy to charge. It'll charge off a solar charger or solar charge controller, and you won't have to use a special kind of charger that BioNO uses to keep things balanced. I am in no way denigrating BioNO. They kind of make different products than each other, but um, I think that, that the Dakota Lithium batteries have a, a space that they can fill in this area and, and they do a good job. I like their product a lot. Good guys to talk to too. They were really helpful when I was putting the field uh, day video, when I was planning the stream. They kind of just sat down with me, worked out some of the numbers and told me like, yeah, you probably need some more batteries, but you could probably run so-and-so this far, you know, so many hours, etc. this power output. They're really, really helpful. So I, I really appreciate that. And as always, we will end the stream today when we get to that point we're going to head over to discord zach's already posted the link to discord discord is like a text chat and a voice chat 
chat room and it's free to use. It runs in its own client or you can run it on a website or you can run it on the phone app. I use all three. It's amazing. It's awesome. It reminds me of IRC back in the day. I loved IRC. One of my favorite things. So super cool that we have something like that for amateur radio and the crew that's over there is a great group of people. And so we did, uh, we do live streams. We do a follow on um, chat room, voice chat, you can call it after the live streams. And it's just always a lot of fun. There's so many good topics that we discuss it goes in all kinds of good tangents. So please check that out. If you're interested, I, I think you'll have a good time. Lastly, and I've got to show some web on this one. So there was an absolute um, uproar. It seems like the last couple of days, everybody's been talking about this, the whole technician um, upgrade thing again that the AWRL is proposing. I've seen polls coming out. I have posts on the Ham Radio Crash Course Facebook group, which again, go join the Ham Radio Crash Course Facebook group if you haven't yet. A ton of people talking about the proposed changes by the AWRL, the, the enhancements to the technician license. And I... I had I just I heard so many arguments and I was getting frustrated all over again from the first time I heard all these arguments. I just made a podcast. So if you go to SoundCloud and you type in Ham Radio Crash Course, you'll find my podcast. And majority of the time it's just uh, rehashed. I download the audio from these streams and I repost them as podcasts. I'm on iTunes. I'm pretty much everywhere. You can find me just by looking for Ham Radio Crash Course. But today was different. I posted it this morning, and it's called the HRCC Technician Enhancement Fireside Chat. So if you're interested, go check that out. I cover all the arguments that I think are um, dubious and lazy arguments, to say the least, and kind of just spend 30 minutes or so walking myself through the whole thing and where my logic comes from. I support the enhancement. I think it's a good thing for the hobby. I think it's a good thing for just about everybody. And I, I don't really see where the arguments are coming from that are against it, so... Yeah. Uh, Tyler Cruz says, watch your video last night about the Baofeng you programmed for a guy. I have a UV82 and can't change the power level from the memory mode, just in the frequency mode. Memory mode can only be changed by the computer. So Tyler, uh, push the uh, pound button, the, the hashtag button, when you're on memory mode, and that should allow you to cycle through low, medium, and high power. Yeah. Lastly, if you guys want to support the channel, there's a couple ways of doing that. I have the Patreon. Patreon starts at a dollar, which allows you access to my newsletter. And it goes up from there with some different perks. Or you can just simply use my Amazon link down below. I have the Amazon, uh, I have an Amazon affiliates page called the Ham Radio Crash Course, which is um, just go check out the products. And if you don't like that, use the search bar and just buy whatever you want to buy on Amazon. I'll get a little cut of it and kind of for bringing you there won't cost you anything and it helps the channel out so appreciate that okay so today is kind of like the last class for the general license i hope everybody had a good time i hope they've learned something hopefully you've been following along with the um the applications on your phone the awrl applications or maybe you're using something like hamstudy.org kind of friends of the ham radio crash course ham hamstudy.org so we're we're kind of at the last class and for technician i did the same thing the last class i did on rules and regulations which is kind of like the boringest one but it's also the one where i kind of go off on tangents and rant a little bit more as i find some of the regulations are a bit funny i, I don't think this would be any different than that but there's a lot of content so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to dive into that now before we do that i'm gonna hit up the the chat room let me go up a bit here. So, uh, Fan TV monitoring the talk group via hose line since I don't have a hotspot yet. Yeah, so again, Brandmeister talk group 31621. If you hop on there and you want to say something, you can do that pretty much any time during the stream. I may turn it off if it gets a little crazy, but it hasn't happened yet. So, if you want to say something, you can go ahead and come now. And V Ruiz, hi Josh, just got first radio because of you and now want to work towards getting my tech. Thank you for the great videos. That's awesome. This is the general class license stream, kind of wrapping it up, but there is a technician one. There's a whole bunch of videos for that. Please check that out. But it won't hurt you learning a lot of this stuff. And anything I cover in the rules and regulations is still going to be apt for technicians. So glad you're here watching. 
Uh, hi, Alex. Hi, Alex Jones. I love that name. Any thoughts on the U.S. Baofeng deal getting fined 2K a day by the FCC? I talked about that in the last stream. Basically, it's it's kind of a lot to do about nothing. The company, I'll just rehash it really quickly. The company marketed the radio as being able to do things it shouldn't do. And it was capable of doing things that it shouldn't do. And it was Part 90 um, certified. Which, if it's Part 90 certified, it should not do the things that it was doing. So FCC had a total valid gripe in what they did. It in no way bans amateurs from getting Baofengs, UV5Rs, whatever. So don't worry about that. You don't have to worry about that at all. All right. Let's see. Hi, guys. Wish I could stay, but I'm just checking in. Wicked Perfect. Sorry, you have to You have to go, man. I have uh, Ham Kid. Hey, Ham Kid. I just subbed to him. Good, good content. Keep working. I have a plan for my HF station now. I just got to get my general and wait for my birthday and Xmas to roll around. I hear you on that. Man, when I was younger, that was like my uh, my major day to come up on all the gear that I wanted to, to then use for the rest of the year. So, yep, have a plan and work that plan <laughs> for sure. Cash is king when it comes to Christmas. So Patrick Dickey said something. I think it was about the Dakota, the Dakota Lithium. I think he was saying, and it's light as a feather compared to SLAs. As for charging, bought a Duracell Ultra and charged it three hours last night. Yeah, the Dakota Lithium batteries are extremely lightweight. So, awesome. Carl, you are not late. Watch your vid last night about the Baofeng. I have a UV. Okay, we just covered that. Changes power, so I think I'm caught up here. Forgot today was the live stream. Uh-oh, this is Sky Loga. And thought I would hop on the DMR talk route to see if anyone was on. Caught me off guard when I was told I was on the stream. Oh, buddy. No problem. It was cool. If you had a question, you can come back and ask it. Mm. That's pretty funny. Carl, hey, what's up, bud? You're not late. I'm watching Hosh and doing some summer reading. Good for you, uh, Ham. Oh, Ham Kid again. Awesome. Keep up the excellent work. Clint's got to go. Take it easy, Clint. If you're already gone, appreciate what you're doing out there, buddy. All right, so let's let's flip her over. Cover some of the uh, other little odds and ends. So this is my Hilltopper 20 that came in the mail. I'm thinking about doing this one next week on the live stream. So if you have any desire to build along with me on a DIY kit, now would be a good time to buy it. I think it's still on summer sale, as they call it. And if you're not following me on Instagram, which you should, I got new QSL cards. The Hosh Nasi KI6 NAZ Ham Radio Crash Course QSL card is in. I love the back. Although the back, you're going to cover this up with a stamp, which I'm a bit bummed out about, but it's got my P.O. box on there, and I like that I can put multiples on here because what happens is when I'm running FT8, for example, I'll work people, um, I'll work one station a couple of times on different bands. It, it always happens. So now I can just put out one QSL card, cover all that I worked them, and how my station was at the time. Super excited about that, and I've got a little bit of space for comments and whatnot. So if you work me, which I'm going to do a push next month to to work a lot more of you guys and try and try and do better in that area cuz whenever we're on Discord Discord has a QSO room that we can go through and work QSOs and and try and hook up with each other and figure out how we're going to make a contact so yeah QSL cards absolutely um, I got these from photoqsls.com photoqsls.com I will post the link in the description after I'm done here. This is an unsolicited. They didn't pay me. They didn't send me these. I paid for these. I like the I like what they were offering, particularly their templates. I think they do a good job. This is totally unsolicited recommendation here. Big fan of their stuff. Okay, so rules and regulation. Here we go. There's the hams that are all following the rules right there. So FCC Part 97 regulations is kind of what we're talking about. We talk about a lot more than that in this chapter, but this is what they're mentioning up front is that they're not going to reprint that in this book. That's not what this is about. And there's a good URL here, awrl.org forward slash part dash 97 dash amateur dash radio. So if you do want to read that, which of course you do, if you're an insomniac, you read that and it helps you go to sleep. With that said, there's still some nice details in there you can kind of hen peck, hunt and peck for what you need at any given time. So yeah, Carl asks, QSO stream soon. Um, yeah, but the problem with the QSO streams is 
you kind of have to like warn people over and over again. They're like, be ready, be ready, QSO stream, QSO stream. We're going to work all the bands, all the, all the modes. And you, you just hope that enough people come out. Sometimes it doesn't work. Cause I mean, I'll, I'll do HF anytime and not many people take me up on that. I do have to remind everybody, all the family is here. So the shrieking you hear is by design, not on purpose, but by design. The ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, is basically the organization that handles a lot of the worldwide rules of amateur radio. Their ITU, as they're called, basically divides us up into regions. North America, South America is region two. Oh, Tom Garcia. Thank you, buddy. Thank you for the dollar. I appreciate that. I love that. When that party, when I'm reading and the party light goes off, I'm like, oh, I feel good in my heart. So thank you for that. Tom, anytime you want, blast off with a question there. And if you want to ask a question via Super Chat, it sticks up longer and it's highlighted so I can see it easy when I look up. That's why it's there for a lot of reasons, other than just supporting the channel. So, all right, ITU Region 1 and 2. Sorry, we're in Region 2. Why this is important is there's contests that, ITU's put, that ITU puts on, and you got to know your ITU number. So just remember you're in 2 if you're in North or South America. All right, Blue Box, Fox Hunting. Fox hunting and direction finding is a major part of our hobby because we use it to find people who are putting out a lot of spurious interference. So events exist, like sporting events, where people set up little kind of fox stations that are kind of pinging out Morse code every once in a while. Sometimes they get really, really devious and they put it on like an oscillating fan that spins back and forth while it's transmitting. And the idea is to use direction finding antennas, beams, to, co to locate, triangulate the station, and the first one to get there wins the fox hunt. Pretty simple, but you got to know your radios. You got to be fairly confident in your radios and know how to use them, particularly with beams. So super fun, lots and lots of fun. That's a great hobby aspect. I haven't done any videos on direction finding, which I need to. I need myself to go out and do more of it because I'm like in a perfect area. There's like a 91 freeway group that does fox hunting and i really need to take advantage of that so hopefully hopefully more of that in the future anyway one event there is one question off of this and it says however the event is organized direction finding skills can be used by amateur auxiliary to locate stations violating fcc rules internationally or intentionally or not intentionally or not not internationally intentionally or not dream beaver hi josh just checking in dream beaver is that like a play on that song dream weaver but dream beaver uh, if that is i love it that's hilarious. Mm. Tom Garcia, thanks for reminding me about that, buddy. In fact, I think you posted a link. It's the Perseids. There's a meteor shower this weekend. I'm told that really the UK and South America is going to fare far better with it. But you can still follow and track it and, and, work and, and find out more about it. If you go to the Ham Radio Crash Course on Facebook, I believe Tom posted a link um, to some of the information. So go check that out. It's going to be interesting there. So, all right, ITU covered that. All right, uh, Region 2 general class licenses have, okay. Part A and B of the section contains frequencies, general class, great. Somebody talking? No, the light came on, but nobody was home. All right. Sometimes these questions, we're going to talk about this. These questions are kind of broken up a little bit weird in the ARRL. Like they're going to cover, it'll be a section heading, but then they'll cover things that seem unrelated. So we're going to be jumping around a little bit. I apologize for that. All right, where are we at? This is not helpful. Part A and B of that section contains the region two frequency allocations that apply to general crass amateur frequencies in the U.S. Okay, just remember parts A and D of that section. It'll come up when we get to the practice test. Okay. Amateur auxiliary. Amateur radio, and it, and it goes in play with this fox hunting thing. The amateur auxiliary is the group of hams, volunteer hams, that go around and they handle the self-policing of the hobby. And it does exist. They really do listen. There's not a lot, not enough, and I think largely they know where the, where the bad apples are and as long as they're staying in their bad apple cart, like the 435, which is potentially on fire right now on Santiago Peak, as long as it's if they stay in their little dirt rotten apple cart, they don't care. They don't they don't really go after them. So that doesn't mean they don't. The amateur auxiliary is a thing, and they they are they are handling the self policing. So if you want to know more, awrl.org forward slash official dash observer dash one. And here's the 
test question. The mission of both the AWRL official observers and the amateur auxiliary is to encourage amateur self-regulation and compliance with the FCC rules. And I wrote in there, rat on your friends, because that's kind of what it is. <laughs> it It is and it isn't, but rat on your friends. Is, I just thought that was funny. KG7YTS says, fox hunts are good, are good search and rescue training. Yeah. Uh, Carl Inc., can they take people to jail? No. <laughs> no. That would be a, a whacker's just love. The whackers would love that if they could do a citizen's, an FCC citizen's arrest on people. You can't. You're basically observing and reporting. You're using your radios. You're triangulating. You're trying to figure out as much information as you can to make a case against somebody. And then a, someone from the FCC usually reaches out for cease and desist with some kind of fines associated to it. That's really all the FCC can do is they can find people. All right. FAA rules. One of the questions you got to remember. Additional restrictions apply if the antenna is within about four miles of the public use airport or heliport. So the FCC and the FAA, they're, they're both federal groups, and they kind of have a loose organization with each other. Radios really don't mess with aircraft. Aircraft really doesn't mess with radios in so much as you get a huge antenna that something could crash into. So if you're within four miles, you do need to look into what that airport would require, what the FAA requires you to do to verify that, you know, or justify that it's okay. It's not that big a deal, though. All right. License elements. So technician license is element two. Technician license is element two, and you're potentially studying for element one. We already mentioned it's a 35 multiple choice question, and the amateur extra exam is element four. There is no element one. Um, that was the five words per minute Morse code exam, which is no longer required for any license class. So keep that in mind as well. Were you previously licensed, which I don't think this pertains to most of the people here, but um, it's a question. If you can provide documentation of being previously licensed, then you had a, an amateur general, advanced, or extra class license that was not revoked, you will be credited with having passed those written exam elements. Welcome back to the hobby. So you can come back anytime should you ever leave, although you shouldn't because there's plenty of stuff you can do. So examiners, volunteer examiner coordinators the VECs are if you think of if you think of amateur radio as a self-policing entity then the VECs are the licensing portion of that self-policing it's all volunteer licensed amateurs implement and they preside over the testing that happens when you go take your license exams and these are the VE the VEs the volunteer examiners how it works is if you get your general license you can become a VE but you're only going to be able to do an examination of technicians. You can't go um, any higher than that. If you want to do general testing, you got to get your extra. So that's basically how it works is you're always one behind. So technician, you got to be a general. General, you got to be an extra. And an extra is still a VE extra, but that's how that works. Let me see here. Okay. Check the chat room. Uh, kid, ham kid snitches get stitches, or in this case, we can aim 1,500 watts through Yaggies at someone. Ham warfare. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Tom Garcia mentions the name of the Observer program is being changed. That is true, but I don't know if that will be before or after the questions in the question pool changing. So stay tuned on that. There may be some errata coming, which just keep in mind that if it does change, it'll probably affect the questions. All right. How many people do we have in the chat right now? 57 people in the chat. Usually happens with a boring topic like uh, like, <laughs> like rules and regulations. But we'll chug along, and next week it'll be more fun. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen to be an accredited VE so long as you hold a general class license or higher U.S. amateur license and meet all the criteria. That's three questions on that topic. So, Three VEs must be in attendance if you're going to do a test of any kind. Now, I will make a note of this, although I don't think this book's message or mentions it specifically, or maybe it does. Did I skip on that? No. It's 
you can do the test in person. In fact, that's how most tests happen. But there are provisions set up if you have a live stream of some kind of the person taking the test and you kind of have enough camera angles or you can see them and the person taking the test and you hear audio. You can technically provide a VE examination over the internet, which I, I don't know. Zach will probably know, and if Dom's in the room, we can ask him on the Discord after the fact. Um, that's a very interesting prospect that we'll be able to license people in the future over the internet, which I think is great. So stay tuned for that. The book doesn't mention any of this, and you're not going to be tested on that, I don't think, but anyway. For example, at least three general class VEs must observe the test session to administer tech class exams. Makes sense. Three primary VEs. Oh, so actually it's right there. I must have skipped over that. The three primary VEs must observe all aspects of the exam session. Observation can be conducted via video from off-site, so the primary VEs need not be physically present if other VEs are available or administer the exam process. VE grade, all exams are responsible to determine correct answers. Good. As a general class license, you are only allowed to administer the element two class exam, which we mentioned that. And that is Edison. He's upset about that. <laughs> this is what your... <laughs> oh, was that somebody on the line there? This is what your application looks like, or your license, I mean, for a VE. This is... Yeah, anyway. I don't know why they show this. This just seems like a waste. Like, you're not going to practice filling out the form, are you? I didn't. I just went in and filled it out. We've got another one, too. That's the one you're probably familiar with. Certificate or certificate of successful completion of examination. These are the ones you get normally, and they circle, you know, element three, element two, cross it out, whatever, and that tells you what you get. Those are where your VEs one, two, and three come from. Oh, Michael Carr says there was a question about video, uh, video exams in the exam book I took this morning. Excellent. Hopefully that comes up in the practice exam when we try it. Well, we're not going to take a practice exam. We're going to cover all the questions in this chapter, so we will see it. Okay, so when you get your general, and this always this is like one of the first questions people ask is, when I get my general, but the FCC database has not updated, it's different from when you got your technician. When you got your technician, you had to wait for the FCC database to show your call sign. Not so with your general. If you get your paperwork, the one we just showed, no, if you get your paperwork, the one we just showed that says you passed your general test, then all you have to do is say temporary AG or slash AG on CW or add forward AG to your digital modes if you're if you're using digital or, or whatever with your call sign. So that way if somebody looks you up and they say, oh, well, this is a technician and they're on general, you won't, you know, they won't report you or anything like that because they know, oh, slant AG, he's got his he's got his call getting upgraded, so I won't worry about it. So just keep that in mind. That's an important thing to note. So here's, <laughs> so identification requirements mentions the whole thing about upgrading your license, but then it, it flips it and says one wrinkle to operating on HF is that you may be able to practice your foreign language skills. The only restriction on speaking foreign languages on the air is that you are required to identify your station in English or by using the English language alphabet only. That's how we do it. You can speak any language you want, but you must identify in English. Sorry for you non-English speakers. Frequency privileges. All right, here's where it gets good. Okay, so roughly the idea of how they came up with this whole system here. This is the radio band plan that the ARRL puts out. Is they just took 300 and divided it by the frequency. And that gives you a rough idea of, of the frequency in megahertz to get you 180, or 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 20. For example, 321, that's 14.3. Okay, the conversion isn't exact. It's just a handy approximation. Practice those two sequences and you're more than halfway home. There's two questions on that, so keep that in mind. Other HF bands have been uh, have been made available in the 1980s called WARC bands. And they're covered in here, and they're some of my favorite bands actually. 30 meters is a WARC band. It's digital and CW only. It's a great band. I really like it a lot. So. Um, this is what you're, as a, as a general, you're going to spend some time looking at this because before you kind of just went to two meters and, and maybe centi uh, 70 centimeters and, 
maybe six meters and went, well, I've got access to all that. It says EAGT, EAGT, EAGT. That's it. I got, I have the full access and my radio will most likely step in unless you have a bell thing and prevent me from transmitting on your frequency, on those frequencies. You're right. That goes right out the window when you have your general, when you have your general, you got to be careful. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I have these, this nifty guide, this nifty guide. Why am I doing that? I'll just show you like this. So you get a better view. This nifty guide will tell you for what meters when your general class pr privileges kick in. This is particularly helpful if you don't operate on, on the bands often. For example, on 20 meters, here's the CW portion, digital and CW. Your general starts at 14.25 megahertz, but the band starts at 14.000. Everything before that is the RIDI and data section for extra. Generals can't get in that area. So having a little thing like this is great. Having a printout of this that's laminated, also helpful. And just look at 20, it's, it's really easy. You can, you say E is extra, A is advanced, and G is general. And you can figure out the band allocations just by looking at this. So pretty interesting here, general, pretty big whack taken out the middle there. That's the single sideband voice side. So general can only work in this black chunk of space that they've got. So keep that in mind. It's important because you can screw up. In fact, on field day, I think I tuned up on, um, on an extra frequency. Also the maritime mobile frequency, but hey, cheers. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Zach is saying there has been um, there has been one Discord group that tested people over Discord to say they could. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. I have the as my wallpaper. Nice. Fan TV says I have the AWRL band plan as my wallpaper on one of my monitors. That's smart. Very smart. I like to not clutter my, I don't look at my desktop. It's always covered. In fact, I should take a screenshot of the chaos that's in my life. So work bands, you may hear that term a lot. Warc bands are usually bands that are not um, permitted for contesting and other things. They're bands that came about from the World Administrative Radio Conference in 1979. And it's what gives you access to 30, 17, 12, 10, 18, and 24 megahertz. Okay, so that's what they mean when they say warc. It was a result of this World Administrative Radio Conference. A coming together where everybody agreed Amateurs, baby. These are your, your frequencies you're going to work on. Um, let's see. Generals have only partial access. Their privileges for... Okay. So... Okay. Here is where I think we're going to dive into 60, where it gets a little... Things get a little funky town. Or is this just talking about the differences? I think I covered most of this. Yeah. General class license privileges extend across all those frequency bands, but not completely. As the frequency chart shows, all for, for all bands where generals have only partial access, their privileges for each mode are located at the top of the band where the mode is permitted. Yeah, we covered that. So the low portion is extra, whether it's CW or then later when you get to single sideband, also extra. The low stuff is all extra and then advanced and then general, which is like the first level of HF. Okay. Generals have all amateur privileges on the 160, 60, 30, 17, 20, and 10 meter bands. So all, all coverage. The only ones you don't are 80, 40, and 20 are the big ones. There are others, 30, I think. No, 30 is a work band. So 60 meters, interesting. And in fact, we should probably look at the, uh, we should probably look at the, the diagram before for 60. The 60 meter band privileges permit channelized operation on upper sideband CW in certain digital modes, only with a power limit on 100 watts ERP. CW ready, ooh. Hey, Fred Thompson, thank you so much, buddy. 199, I get that cool teal color. I like that. Matches my hat and my shirt that I got on today. <laughs> Again, if you have a question, I appreciate I appreciate the, the super chat, but. Do utilize it, because I can see that. It's super bright when it shows up, but thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. Uh, okay. If you're operating in a secondary am amateur location and a station in the primary service begins transmitting, you must stop transmitting. So 60 is a shared band, and amateur radio is a secondary citizen on that band. If anybody that's a primary citizen shows up and says, it's my turn, my go, shut it down. Don't even bother talking on it. And further, you're limited on 100 watts ERP, which we'll mention. Basically, it's recommended if you're going to do 60, 
Um, just use a dipole since you're not going to get any gain. You're not going to do any. You're not going to have to do any power calculations to make sure you're not going above that 100 watts power output, which we will talk about. It does come up. All right, beacons. I love beacons, and I didn't do this before. We may tangent off before we go to the practice exam. Bring up a beacon. So beacons are. They're used for observation and propagation and reception, as well as for other relative uh, activities. So beacons are different trans transmitters that are scattered around the Earth, basically, that are all operating on the same frequency. And they're timed in such a way, and you can actually go on websites that will tell you, oh, this beacon is now transmitting. Oh, now this beacon is transmitting. And now this beacon's transmitting. And they're doing it on, like, CW frequencies. And so you'll turn to one frequency, and you'll just listen. And you can look at the website and it'll say, okay, this beacon that's really close to you is transmitting. Oh, I can hear that one. This beacon, a little bit farther out. Ah, it's, I can send the noise. I can still hear it. This beacon, way further out, can't hear it. So that gets you an idea, depending on what band you're on and what beacon you're listening to, what the distance is. Oh, okay, I get a pretty good idea how propagation is. Beaconing is really nice. They do something called reverse beacon dot net here do, 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 do. reverse beacon dot net works the reverse of that so if you are on the right frequency and you're using something like cw on the right right band and you key up and you do something like cq cq and then your call sign you'll actually get something that picks up your call and posts it to a website and say you were reverse beacon by such and such um such and such station very, very helpful. There are some YouTube videos out there that cover reverse beaconing. I'll let you guys look that up if you're interested. But beacons are great. If you want to see one, ncdxf.org. Awesome. I like beacons a lot. I use them uh, for CW a lot because it's what they primarily run in. All right. Whew. Man, that's sour. <laughs> I bit off. I might have bit off more than I can chew with this thing. It's very light, very low alcohol, but man, is it sour. If you guys like sour, this is, it's very sour. It's not bad, but it's, it's not the best sour I've had, that's for sure. Okay. Um, the question in that whole beacon discussion is, the FCC rules, the FCC rule also lists the frequency ranges in which beacon operation is permitted. Oh, that's good. So we'll see a question related to beacon operation and then frequency space that is governed by the FCC. To minimize repeater to re repeater, okay, repeater coordination. This is important. This is kind of outside general, kind of more important to techs, but we'll go with that. Repeater coordination requires some informal effort by someone. And normally that's done by somebody called the frequency coordinators or the regional repeater coordinators. And what they basically do is they maintain a list of all the frequencies, the receive and offset for a frequency or for a repeater. And they kind of try and keep everybody off of each other. And based off of the power output and the relative elevation of the repeater, they get an idea of what the propagation is going to be like. And that allows them to keep people separated without overlapping so that they don't have people that are talking all over. Um, I'm seeing Discord on the side. Um, that way they don't have people that are talking all over each other when they're setting up a repeater. So repeater coordination is very important. Where's the question here? The FCC has made it quite clear that they expect amateurs to use the respect for local frequency coordination process as a manner of good amateur practice, which we'll talk about good amateur practice shortly. But the idea being is they want us to do things on our own and they want us to not be jerks. So that's it in a nutshell. All right. Third party traffic. Okay. This one's pretty straightforward. Third party traffic is any traffic that doesn't originate from an amateur to another amateur, meaning um, Costa Rica, right? If there's an amateur that receives a message from somebody there to get it out to somebody in the States to let people know that they're okay, that's third party traffic. And there's all kinds of rules associated with that. But understand, FCC rules with the constraint that the communications must be non-commercial and of a personal, unimportant nature or be messages related to emergencies or disaster relief. So pretty straightforward. If, if everything's down and you can't make a contact and you use ham radio, it shouldn't be about business. It should be about helping the emergency. 
That's how the FCC rules it. So makes sense. Unless the country's administration has notified the ITU that it objects to such communications. So that's another thing that can happen. The, uh, these countries could say, do not accept third party uh, communication through us. We want to handle that on our own and we don't want to communicate with F XYZ country. That's a real thing. So you have to be careful about that as well. And that goes to this follow on rule that we'll get to. If we don't have we, it, whatever country you're in, in this case, the United States, doesn't have an agreement with that other country, you're not supposed to talk to them, right? It has to be a standing agreement for two countries to be communi in communication with each other via radio before you even make the call or complete the call with that station. So keep that in mind. And that's that's being legal in the eyes of the law. I realize that's a bit, uh, it's a bit more in the weeds a bit, but yeah, whatever. All right. Definition and rules. Whew. Let's see. Yeah, this is just defining what third party traffic is. There's only one bullet that's like really um, no duh or important. All the rest of these are no duh. Third party traffic may never be exchanged on behalf of someone whose amateur license has been suspended or revoked or not reinstated. So don't be a ham like a, a straw, like a ham radio straw purchase of communication. Can't do that, particularly if that person's been outlawed. Ham radio outlaw. Don't do that. All right. International considerations. When signals cross national borders, the rules change. International third-party communications are prohibited unless the country in question specifically allows third-party communications to and from U.S. hands. Talked about that. Pretty straightforward. Prohibited and restricted communications. All right, here we go. <laughs> there are a few general prohibitions. Um, false distress signals is absolutely prohibited under all circumstances as obsc as is obscene or indecent speech. So the 435 repeater or the 8 point, what is it, 04420 repeater on 80 meters, 75 meters. That would be an example of obscene indecent speech technically no bueno on that but it happens i mentioned the rotten apple carts can stay on that side of the road they know they exist they know they're there they know who they are and that's how they leave it um there is there is one question that's going to come up and it's 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 kind of neither here nor there i don't know why this is such a big deal but i get it they've got to have a discussion on it so Transmitting music is prohibited. You cannot transmit music over radio. Any me well, just don't transmit music over over a radio. Even if you think you're the right copyright holder or the le the legal owner or whatever, the only instance when it's permitted is when it's incidental part of a manned spacecraft transmission. So simply, if you've got someone in the ISS and they're doing a QSO down to somebody on earth and and another astronaut has music playing and it's picked up on the radio they don't want to do it but that is the only quote-unquote lawful incidental use of music in radio and that is a question that came up on my general question third-party traffic agreements is in the book you can look this up these are all the states we have third-party traffic Nope, let me just key it up. These are all the states that we have third-party traffic with, okay? So you can work those stations or those countries. Um, okay, question I always get, always get. Another type of prohibitive transmission is codes that are intended to obscure the meaning of the message. Very, very big in the prepper community. Preppers want to know how to encrypt all their comms. And it's illegal, straight up, not allowed can't do it. Um, you can, <laughs> I take that back. You can do it. Not legal to do. So keep that in mind. And so what about Q signals or pro signs? Q code, QRP, right? That's a Q code. There's no, the, um, there's no deciphering that has to happen there. Those are standards of, um, like acronyms, shortening of words that we use. So Q codes, 
Totally fine, totally legal, no issue with Q codes. Use Q codes to your heart's content. It can't be something where there's some kind of cipher or there's some unknown piece of information that you sound like you're doing gibberish. Number stations, right? Like those old school Cold War number stations are an example of like an encrypted communication. It's just some say, somebody saying numbers. If you don't have a rubric or some cipher that says, oh, 1435, oh, that means I need to go have a Whopper today, you know, Burger King Whopper. Stuff like that, right? It, if it's encoded, can't do it on amateur radio. So keep that in mind. All right. Uh, let's see. Are encryption or secret codes ever allowed? Yes. Only when used to control a space station. And it, it mentions this in parentheses, which I think is funny. Not the ISS, but any station operating in space, such as an amateur satellite. If you could, with your HD, be like, I'm flying the ISS. I think that's funny. Oop. One. Make sure we're on the... I think that's hilarious. I'm just going to fly the ISS right now with my radio. I know it's not like that. You're not like actually using a trackball. But the SEC has ruled that the coded commands are not intended to obscure the message. What is that? For radio-controlled aircraft. Yes. So you can use amateur radio, your amateur radio license, to get some pretty big distance on amateur aircraft uh, drones etc all right uh we'll mention the repeater thing this is kind of a weird one but um is it okay for a technician licensee to transmit on the vhf uh uplink and have the satellite retransmit their signals on the 10 meter band the satellites are acting as repeater stations that are simultaneously uh, retransmit the signals of other stations on another frequency. The same question applies to terrestrial crossband repeaters that receive signals on one frequency band and retransmit them on another frequency band. Okay, what is that saying? So if you had two repeaters and one repeater was VHF, UHF, and this other repeater picked up the output of this repeater and retransmits it on a different frequency that potentially the operator over on the first repeater does not have privileges on, the station or the operator of that repeater, the secondary repeater, needs to be general at least, and it mentions it. Such transmissions are permitted if the control operator of the repeater transmitter that operates on the HF band has a general class license or higher. Keep that in mind. Okay. Oh, okay. There we go. This is another one. This whole thing is kind of about money and business being done on radio. Much is made, uh, much is made as well over prohibition of business-related and pecuniary monetary interests in activity on the amateur bands. In your technician studies, you learned about what is considered business and what is the incidental personal interest in communication. Okay, this is perfectly legitimate if you want to have like a swap net or like if you want to talk about selling equipment you already own, etc. You can talk about that. But there are some caveats. So it's perfectly legitimate as long as the other amateurs are being notified of the sale of apparatus normally used in an amateur station and such activity is not done on a regular basis. Meaning you don't, you're not running a business saying on the radio, hey, come on out to Joe's crazy ham shack for crazy stupid deals and you're, every five minutes you're keying up saying that. Probably not legal. That means household goods may not be sold and no selling radios every week at a profit either. Uh, yeah, I don't know how, I, yeah, let's just leave it. Let's just stick to what the test says. <laughs> okay, written records. This is talking about logging. Logging, keeping a log. A lot of people have moved to digital logs, online logs, like Logbook of the World. That's what I use. I also use QRZ, but generally I use Logbook of the World because it integrates so nicely with all the awards that they have. However, it's very kludgy and cumbersome to set that up. So I'll probably make a video sometime in the future, but man, it's it's kind of a, a, a nightmare out there when it comes to logging in some cases. Uh, you could just keep paper logs or you could just have an Excel file. You could do whatever you want. Generally, what's in a log? The date and time of the contact, the band or frequency and mode of the contact, the call sign of station contacted, this and by no means is the only useful information to keep. Oh, illiterate beef, past tech this week. Your videos helped a lot. Thank you, buddy. That's awesome. Love it. I love Zach. 
Lol, new HRO ad. Every five minutes on every frequency. There you go. That's how you do it right there. That's how you get some major foot traffic from people who want to kill you. <laughs> okay. So written records. For 60 meter operation only, if you're using an antenna other than a dipole, record. Oh, is it still? I'll let. I don't know why that was held for review. That's weird. If you're using an antenna other than a dipole, record the antenna gain calculations or manufacture data for antenna use. This is to ensure that 100 watts ERP restriction is met. So again, 60 meters, you're restricted on power output. If that antenna has forward gain, you've got to calculate the gain's effect on your power output. If you're putting out too much power, you're going to come up above the 100 ERP, which means you'd be in violation of the FCC regulations for 60 meters. So what should you do? Cover your butt and record your math that you used on that. All right. So this whole thing, I think, yeah, culminates basically on starts with rules and standards, but it starts with good amateur practices. We're going to spend a little bit of time here. So good amateur practices, instead of setting all these rules for every possible situation, the FCC basically says, hey, guys, perform and work with the basic tenets of good amateur practices. Now, <laughs> they say, where is it exactly? This is, it's, 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 it's nicely worded. Where is it? Amateur stations should be operated in conformance with good engineering and good amateur practice. Okay, sounds good so far. While the FCC reserves the right to rule on what uh, what is and what isn't good engineering and good amateur practice, amateurs themselves set the day-to-day -day operating standards. So be smart, be a good engineer, be a nice person, and oh, by the way, we're the final adjudicator on whether we agree with you or not. So that's basically how that works. So just memorize that. That's just the way it is. Good amateur practice. Amateurs are expected to educate themselves and assist others in doing so, which is what we're doing here, what you're doing when you Elmer, what you do when you work at clubs or go to your club. So same thing. Transmitters and amplifier power. All right. This is very easy but they seem to take a very long time to explain something that I think is very easy. Maximum power output for generals and extras when not otherwise stated is 1,500 watts of power. That's the limit. That's the upper limit, full power. For technicians that have access to the HF frequencies, which there are some, 10 meters, uh, 20 meters, 40 meters, 80 meters off the top of my head. Is that right? I don't. I take that back. There's one of them that they don't have. Hold on. Uh, 10 meters, 15 meters, 40 meters, 80 meters. No 20, which is a bummer because that's one of the best bands right now. 200 watts PEP. Technicians can only use 200 watts PEP on, um, on the frequency bands, HF frequency bands. Amateurs are restricted to 200 watts. Keep that in mind. Amateurs are always required to use... Okay. Here's the, this is one of those good practicing things. Just because you have access to 1,500 watts, if your contact is being made, you shouldn't use 1,500 watts. You should use much less than 1,500 watts. And that's actually a requirement. And they're getting loud. Amateurs are restricted to 100 watts ERP on 60-meter band with a maximum signal bandwidth of 2.8 kilohertz. Okay? That's the 60 meters. 60 meters is a bit special. That's the channelized frequency space. So uh, Dan Hughes asks, I missed it. What is the beer of the day? It is the Nautilus Harborer by Modern Times. It is a barrel-aged sour. Good Lord. <laughs> Good Lord. Uh, if you don't like sours, do not touch this thing. With that said, it's, it's, it's good. But um, I wouldn't drink it and then be talking. I put, I hurt myself a bit here because I'm both expected to drink something very tart, which puckers me up, and then also speak, which is not good. This is poor, poor decision plan, poor planning on my part. Uh, let's see. Uh, so good, good point here with 60. 
I recommend people just avoid 60 until they get more comfortable. Basically, if you've got an antenna that has 3 dB gain and your transmit output power is 100 watts, 3 dB is a factor of 2, so your ERP is 100 times 2, 200 watts. So you got to jack your transmitter down to 50 watts to keep it under 100 watts ERP. So Dan Hughes, I got that a total wine and more. Uh, si Ooh, Wayne Dickinson has Hair of the Dog Cerberus, which is a cider. I've had that. It's good. It's very good. I can confirm. Novice and technician licensees operating on HF are limited to 200 watts, but general and extra licensees can use full 1500 watt power. And for novice, uh, output in formal novice segments. Okay, novice. Nobody has novice. Don't worry about novice. I don't know why they mention it if you're getting your general, but I guess in, in the sense they want you to know everything, so that's fine. So digital transmissions. All right. All of this for digital transmissions, rules and regulation, is going to be centered around bandwidth, bandwidth, and more bandwidth. Bandwidth is the thing that, that is the most important to keep tabs of when you're running digital. You want your bandwidth as small as possible to make the contact that will affect your data output. And so here's the question from the test. As the size of the amateur bands increase with the frequency faster and wider signals are allowed, at 33 centimeters, which is 902 megahertz and above, there is no limit except for the band edges themselves, creating an auto bond of amateur digital signaling. Cool. So basically, you as you get higher and higher up to 900 megahertz and, and higher, you it really removes some of the speed uh, restrictor plates, if you will, from your bandwidth, which allows you to send uh, fast scan television, for example, live data, right, live video over radio. But you've got to have the right system to do that. Not cheap equipment to do that. Okay, so that is the the general class license book. Right there, the ARRL General Class License Manual. We've been spending months on this. I'm glad everybody stuck with me. We may do one more class weeks from now, probably, where we just sit down and do practice tests. We'll do technician and general practice tests, or, or maybe just general. But we did it. We did it. In fact, um, I think, how long is this thing good for? So 2019. I think I'm going to give this away to somebody. I don't know how I want to do it yet. And I will, um, I'll figure out how to do it on the Facebook group. So you got to go giant, join the Ham Radio Crash Course, and I will give you my personal general class license manual book that's all tagged, floppy tagged, and highlighted on, and notes taken. Um, my book, you can have it. Some lucky person will get my book. I don't even know if you want my book. I'll, I'll make you take my book. What we're going to do now, let's... Let's look at those test questions. Uh, wife takes the general test stream. Jeez, I don't even. <laughs> I don't even know I want to do that. <laughs> okay, communic. Uh, were we G one? I think we were G one. Hey Edison, you're a little loud, bud. is trying to keep them in the playroom. Dream Beaver, I believe you can get me through the night. All right, where is it? There it is. All right. Okay, so here's our, here's our, ooh. Hold on, hold on, hold on. In fact, I, I, I could probably just leave it right here because we want to see the A, B, C, D. Anyway, on which of the following bands is a general class license holder granted all amateur frequency privileges? Oh, see, this is a good one. This is good. See, because you got to see some of these ones are like brutal. It, it's probably easier to go backwards from where you know they don't. So uh, where are they granted all amateur frequency privileges? A's out, 20 has restrictions. B's out, 40 has restrictions. C is in, uh, and 10 is protect. Oh, um, hmm. I, I, it's either C or D. C or D.
No? See? So what's the difference in 15? 15, 15, yep. You got it. So 15 meters has restrictions. So C is the answer. Boom. Got it. Uh, on which of the following bands is phone operation prohibited? I mentioned this. Prohibited. My One of my favorite bands. And honestly, when it comes to digital and CW, probably one of my favorite bands. I'll let you guys answer this one because come on. Come on. I already mentioned it. Ah, and everybody in the chat got the last question correct. Good job, guys. Good job, everyone. I don't know why I'm turning into a, a British person. Welcome to Hogwarts. You're an amateur radio operator, Harry. Um, PLD and Mayor and no 60 on D. I don't know what that is. Uh, PLD and Mayor, got it. It is B. On which of the following bands is image transmission prohibited? Mm. Mm. I'll also let you guys answer this one. I really like this little nifty card. I should buy, see if I can get like a group buy on some of these. You guys be interested in these? Like these cool little band books? Like semi waterproof pages. I really like this. Oh, yeah. Who's excited about that? PLDN Mayor says because Sir Patrick Stewart is back as Picard. Yeah, dude. I'm excited about that. So, B, 30 meters again. 30 meters. No image transmission. Just digital and CW. Which of the following amateur bands is restricted to communication on only specific channels other than frequency ranges? I've already mentioned this. Many times, it's 60 meters. Which of the following frequencies is in the general class portion of the 40 meter band? Which of the following frequencies? So this is an easy question. It's easy because you can cut out 40 megahertz right off the top. Oh my God. Zach says I should put the book on eBay. A, a bidding war to the bottom. <laughs> Everybody just keeps under, offering less and less. Uh, this is an easy one because um, the, the 40 megahertz. No 40 megahertz. Right? Mm. Carl's jumping in. Carl's saying A. You got it, Carl. There you go, boy. Which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 75 meter band? So you're going to get, oh, this is this is one of the problems with, with some of this stuff. This is just pure memorization. You get yourself one of these cards like this, study the band plan. That's really the only way to do it other than memorizing, other than memorizing the, um, the, the test questions. Yeah. I kind of hate this question because people don't really, I mean, they do refer to it as 75 meters, but it's, it's not it's 75 meters guys, 75 meters, not, yeah. Did we get it yet? So it's either a, or it's either B or C, right? Ah, C? Yes, should be C. Come on. There it is, C. So if 40 is 7 megahertz and 20 is 14 and 80 is something and 75 is something, so the higher you go, the lower the frequency should be. 3.75 is within 80 meters, but 3.9 being higher should be on the 75 meter side. Which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 20 meter phone ban? Um, okay, this one could be. I, these questions, man. Like, this is just mean. <laughs> this one's always just mean. 
These questions are just mean. See, those are all 14 megahertz. Oh, 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 wait, wait. yeah, 14 kilohertz. There you go. No, no dot. Dot, dot operator is important. Well, remember. See, I, I suggest having uh, spending some time with these. So 40 tops out, or I'm sorry, what? Am I 40? Get out of here. 20 tops out at 14.35. So does that help you? 14, I'm sorry, 14.350. Yeah, so that should help you out a lot. Good, C. Which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 80 meters band? 3560 or 36.50? I don't know if Bill's got it, but it's, there you go. It's 3560. Which of the following, oh my God. Which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 15 meter band? 15 meter band. It's 21, right? Yeah. 21, 300. Which of the following frequencies is available to a control operator holding a general class license? Ooh. This one's just mean. God. I, <laughs> this question sucks. So if you're not taking the practice exam, I'm not taking the practice exams. I'm reading the book um, and trying to give you my human approach and how I remember things. I'm not remembering questions. This one is, this one's a, a B. This one you just have to remember. Oh, all of these choices though, man. Seriously? I don't know, dude. That's a, that's a trick. Is it? I'll let you guys tell me. That one, see that one's, those mess with you. How did I ever pass my general? Probably by not having that question. <laughs> Where is it? Okay. Huh? Wait. Oh, is it all of them? Yeah, it's all of them because there's no restrictions. So that's a trick question. Okay, hold on. Let and let's talk through why. Oh no, it's not a trick question. Is it? No, it is. Um. So general class licensees hold the access towards the whole band. There's no restrictions. See that bottom there is general AE. So that's so that's a trick question on the other side. That's actually a freebie. Yeah, PLDN Mayor, he said it correctly. You got to know the all of these questions to avoid getting screwed up. This is one of them. In this case, though, this is a freebie. This one is basically saying uh, every if it's if it's within the 15 meter band, you're good because you're a general and that's good enough. So good work on that one. That's kind of nice that they threw that one and giving people a bone. When general class licenses are not permitted to use the entire voice. Oh, sorry. When general class licenses are not permitted to use the entire voice portion of a particular band, which portion 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 of the voice segment is generally available to them? The lower frequency end, uh, 7,300, I'm sorry, 7.3 megahertz and the upper end of frequencies above 14,150. The upper frequency end. We've covered this. It is really loud, Leia. Can you, can we, can we do something about that? <laughs> it's, it's the upper end. getting so loud sorry about the noise which of the following applies when the fcc rules designate the amateur service as a secondary user in the band amateur sta stations shut up when a primary user comes on we record the call sign amateurs are allowed to use the band only during emergencies amateur stations are allowed to use the band only if they do not cause harmful interference primary user amateur stations may operate during yeah so it's c you cannot create interference what is the appropriate action 
if when operating on either 30 meter or 60 meter bands, a station in the primary service interferes with your contact? I love this one. This is one of my favorite questions on the test because this is when I took it, even though the, the pool has changed since then. It's always increase your power to overcome the interference. <laughs> That's, I love it. Um, so what is the appropriate action in a 30 meter station? Uh, a station in the primary service interferes. So it's just move, move, get out of the way. It's get out of the way. So you're not the primary, you're a secondary user. So just get out of the way. In what ITU region is operation in the 7.175 and the 7.300 megahertz band prohibited for control operators holding an FCC license general class? What ITU region is operation? Region two, our region. We're in region two. Okay. So that's, oh my goodness. How many questions are there on these? Oh boys, we've got some time here. We have got a lot of questions to get through apparently. <laughs> what is the maximum height above ground to which an antenna structure may be? Oh no, I think we did this one. No, oh, uh, did we do this? 100 feet? No, 50 feet, 200 feet, good. Transmitter power, what is the maximum 1500, wait. 10? Wait, what's going on here? 10, hold on. I gotta look through some of these really quick. Uh, these are, yeah, no, there's a lot of questions for rules and regulations. I totally forgot about that. Good Lord. What is the following limitations apply to the transmitter power? Okay. Well, we have passed time here. We've hit our hour. And these are a lot of questions. So I'm going to let you guys get through the rest of those. Hopefully you are taking the practice test and practice exams. Because I would like to do some Q&A. So if we have some Q&A, start posting your questions right now while I cover one of our most important things. Thank you to the patrons. I'm trying to roll out some new stuff to the patrons we already have, but these are our $10 patrons, what I call the producers. These are the people that I go to for a lot of my um, patron picks, um, and they get access to other things as well that I'm trying to add some more to. Hopefully the stickers will be coming soon. But Carrie, one of the first. Michael Neeswender, I think, was the first. We've got Jason. Jason, thank you so much for letting me borrow your, your Baofeng. It's back in the mail. You should get it soon. Garrett Larson. Dennis Dunderdale, Bo Brewer. Actually, I think Bo left us. It's okay, Bo. You can come back at any time. Ken Neiman, uh, Brad Snyder, Dave, uh, Davis Dansero. I think, is that right? I think I might have spelled that wrong. Sorry. And I definitely spelled Dead Johnson wrong. <laughs> Sorry. I had to update this and I was in a hurry. Dennis Mickelson, Franklin Lewis, Anthony, just Anthony, Danny Miller, Jace Ravenfield, Jason KG7BGM, Gareth Broadhead, Chris Ebert, and the Brew Crew, which we just talked to you guys all in one big group because you're a big drunken rabble. Anyway, thanks so much. So questions. Uh, Dan Hughes asks, how hard is extra compared to general? Much harder. It, it's just much harder. Um, I, I'll be honest. I don't think... So I don't think the questions that say, hey, if you were a general class and there's frequency what should you be in? The ones we just looked at. Those aren't hard. Those are just like, hey, remember this, you'll be fine. Not difficult though. Extra has more like specific scenarios where you have to pick the right thing. And, and the question is formulated in such a way that you kind of have to know why. Like, what is it? what is it that that device does that allows you to be able to to tune your radio or, or do whatever on a given circuit. Plus there's a lot more images and you got to pick things out. Jason Siebert. I thought the extra was very technical compared to general. It is. Due to bandwidth limitations on 60 meters, I use um, a use of amplitude modulation effectively prohibited. Due to bandwidth. 
is the use of AM effectively prohibited? Don't know. I don't know the answer to that question because I seldom use AM. I've never used uh, voice on 60. So. Uh, Michael Carr, that's probably a good way to, to explain it. Extra requires more electronics knowledge versus procedures and operation. Some difficulty, just different areas of knowledge. With that said, let's pull up a beacon. Let's do that right now. Let's do... Uh, 20 meter beacon. See, love this. All right, so why don't we pick something? We'll just do 14 100. Oh. You got somebody coming in. What? Let's go to fourteen one hundred. Okay, nuts to this. And we'll just leave it to see if we can hear it come up. So this is what's transmitting right now. Kenya, now Israel is on 14100. Carl Ng says the ICOM uh, 7300 looks complex. Is it? No, it's not. It, it has complexity. It has portions that can make it very complex looking, but it is not that complex. Your meat and potatoes, say your 75% of use cases, is all right on that front screen. Very easy to get to. So, Argentina now transmitting. Peru now transmitting. So W six W X we may hear if they if they Venezuela. It could be them or it could be somebody else. New York. Nuanvant, which is V-E-8-A-T. Oh, that's like the North Pole. I don't know what my wife cooked, but it smells really weird in this house right now. Oh, see, I didn't even hear California. There's a Y. You hear it kind of fading. That's New Zealand. Australia, not in space yet. All right, so that's how it works. Like, I, I hope you're seeing the bottom, the bottom of the website, right? Oh, I can't. <laughs> Which way am I pointing? Uh, down here, it keeps changing. Now Japan's transmitting. Oh no, ham kid. I'm not insulting her cooking. I'm saying what she smell, what she cooked smells different. <laughs> it's not bad. Probably tastes great. Oh yeah, Michael Carr. Good congratulations on that. Okay, so that's beaconing in a nutshell. And no SSTVs. No, no, no. I'll turn that off right now. Forgot about that. Okay, let me mute this. Carl, SS single sideband is mainly used in HF. Yes, there are some AM holdouts that still use AM, but it's mostly in 80 meters that they hang out. Uh, v Ruiz, I think you already got the help 
in the chat, but BFF8 HPs only operate on a low of 134 megahertz, I think. You can't go below that. And that's just the physical capability of the radio. That's just kind of at the bottom. Oh, 136. The Fallout Fallout player got it. 136 megahertz. Good for you. I spent about an hour a day. Yeah, okay, cool. So, all right. All right, well, we're just past an hour here. I think that's a good spot to leave it. Yeah, congratulations, Michael, indeed. He went and did Tech, General, and Extra all in one shot. That's... You got to like that. That's some uh, testicular fortitude is, I believe, the word they use for that. So congratulations, buddy. That's awesome. All right, guys. I'll wrap it up. We're going to leave here. I'm going to go to the restroom, and then we're going to hit Discord. So hop out of here, but make sure, make sure you join the Facebook Ham Radio Crash Course. And if you don't like Facebook, hit up the Reddit. Hit up the Reddit and go join that post there. I know it's a little quiet right now. I try to get out there and look at things and comment, but... I'm not that big of a Redditor, and our major Redditor, Ethan, he's in Madagascar right now. I don't know if he's watching. Ethan, if you're watching this, hi, Ethan. I know you said you're going to watch. I should have said that earlier. Our uh, One of our admins is just out there doing uh, missionary work in Madagascar. I hope everything's well and, and going good, and I hope that SDR up converter is still working for him. I shipped an, uh, him an up converter, so I hope it's doing what it needs to do. So, okay, we're going to hop out of here. And if you could, I, I would, I, if you could personally do this, take go take the link in the description to the SoundCloud and listen to that podcast that I did. Let me know what you think. I'd like to know your opinion. If you lasted this long, you're, you're probably someone that's a bit passionate about amateur radio. So go listen to that podcast and tell me your thoughts. I'd really appreciate it. Okay, that'll do it. I'll see you all very, all of you, all of you very shortly over on the Discord. All right? Okay. <laughs>